Sex and Character by Otto Weininger Introduction All thinking begins with intermediate generalizations and then develops in two different directions. One toward concepts of ever higher abstraction which encompass ever larger areas of reality by registering properties shared between ever more things, the other, toward the intersection of all conceptual lines, the concrete complex unit, the individual, which we can only approach in our thought with the help of an infinite number of qualifications and which we define by adding to the highest generalization a thing or something, an infinite number of specific distinguishing features. Thus fish were known as a class of animals separate from mammals, birds and worms on the one hand, long before distinctions were made between osseous and cartilaginous fish, and on the other hand, long before it was felt to be necessary to include fish with birds and mammals within a larger complex, through the concept of the vertebrate, and to distinguish that larger complex from worms. This self-assertion of the mind over the innumerable similarities and differences that make reality so confusing has been compared to the struggle for life among all beings. We fend off the world through our concepts. Slowly and gradually we bring the world under the control of our concepts just as we first restrain a madman's whole body in a rough and ready fashion in order to at least impose some limits on his ability to be a danger and only restrain his individual limbs once we feel comparatively safe. Two concepts are among the oldest used by mankind to eke out a makeshift intellectual existence. They have often gone minor corrections and been taken to the workshop in order to be patched up after a fashion, when a wholesale reform was needed. Odd bits have been removed or added, reductions made in some cases and enlargements in others, just as new needs gradually assert themselves against an old electoral law which is forced to unfasten one leash after another. On the whole, however, we believe that we can still manage along familiar lines with the concepts that I have in mind here, the concepts of man and woman. We talk about lean, thin, flat, muscular, energetic women, women of genius, women with short hair and deep voices and about beardless, garrulous men. We even accept that there are unwomenly women, masculine women and unmanly, feminine men. Concentrating on one characteristic alone that is used to assign a person to a sexual category at birth, we even dare to combine some concepts with attributes that actually negate them. Such a state of affairs is logically untenable. Who has not listened and contributed to heated discussions about men and women or the liberation of women in a circle of friends or in a salon, at a scientific or public meeting? In such conversations and debates, men and women, with dreary regularity, were placed in total opposition to each other, like white and red balls, as if there were not the slightest difference between balls of the same colour. There was never any attempt 
to discuss individual issues as such. And since everybody had only his own individual experiences to go by, there was naturally no possibility of agreement. As is always the case when different things are described by the same word, when language and concepts do not coincide. Is it really the case that all men and all women are totally different from each other, and that all those on either side of the divide, men on the one hand, women on the other, are completely alike in a number of respects? This is, this is assumed, of, of course, most of the time unconsciously, in all discussions about se sexual differences. <laughs> Nowhere else in nature are there such glaring discontinuities. We find continuous transitions between metals and non-metals, chemical compounds and mixtures, and intermediate forms between animals and plants, phanogams and cryptogams, mammals and birds. Initially, it is only because of a very general practical need for an overview that we create divisions set up boundaries by force and distinguish separate arias within the infinite melody of all things natural but sense becomes nonsense good deeds a nuisance is as true of the old intellectual concepts as it is of the inherited rules of social behavior in view of the analogy cited we may be permitted to consider it unlikely that in nature a clean cut was made between masculinists on the one hand and feminists on the other, and that a living being can be simply described as residing on this side or that side of such a gulf. Even grammar is not that strict. In the controversy about the woman question, the anatomist has often been called upon to act as arbitrator, and carry out the controversial demarcation between those qualities of the masculine and feminine cast of mind that are unalterable because they are innate and those qualities that are acquired. In any case, it was a strange idea to make the answer to the question of the natural capability of man and woman dependent on the anatomist's findings, as though if all other kinds of experiences were really unable to establish any difference between them, an excess of 120 grams of brain on one side could have disproved such a result. However, sober anatomists, when asked for criteria that apply without exception, whether in respect of the brain or of any other organ of the body, will answer always that it is not possible to demonstrate constantly recurring sexual differences between all men on the one hand and all women on the other. Although, they will say, the skeleton of the hand in the majority of men is different from that in the majority of women, it is not possible to determine the sex of a woman or sex of a person from isolated parts, either in skeletal form or preserved together with muscles, ligaments, tendons, skin, blood and nerves. The same holds for the thorax, the sacrum and the skull. And what about that part of the skeleton which, if anything, should show strong sexual differences, the pelvis? After all, the pelvis is generally believed to be adapted for the act of birth in one case and not in the other. But even the pelvis cannot serve as a certain criterion. As every man in the street knows, and anatomists know a little more in this respect, there are enough women with a narrow masculine pelvis and enough men with a broad feminine pelvis. Are there no sexual feature differences then? Might it perhaps be wiser in the end not to distinguish between men and women at all? How do we resolve this question? The old answers are insufficient, but we cannot do without them. Accordingly, where the traditional concepts do not suffice, we shall abandon them, but only in order to seek new and better 
bearings.